What's doing, everybody? Welcome to First Class Fatherhood. I'm Alec Lace, and before I hit you with today's interview, make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel and hit the link in the description so you can listen to all of the interviews I've done with so many tremendous dads, including Dana White, Deion Sanders, Tony Hawk, and so many others. Now let's get going with today's interview. Joining me now, First Class Father, Drew Bledsoe. Welcome to First Class Fatherhood. Hey, man, it's my pleasure to be here, man, and thanks for doing this, man. This is an important message, and it's uh, it's really cool to see that uh, you've developed a lot of success talking about being a dad, man. It's cool. Yeah, thank you for that. Let's start it right here, Drew. How many kids do you have, and how old are they? We've, uh, we've got four kids. Uh, oldest is 22. He's about to graduate from Cal Poly down in San Luis Obispo. Uh, second one, is uh, as we speak, is uh, 20 years old. He's uh, in his third year at uh, Washington State University playing some football up there. Uh, that's John. And then Henry is uh, 18. He is a freshman at the University of Denver. And our daughter, Healy, is a junior in high school. Wow, very cool. Yeah, I have I have four children myself here. Uh, did you get involved with coaching the kids at all when they were playing their sports growing up? Or did you uh, stay away from that and watch it all from the sideline? Yeah, you know, my 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 goal was to just be dad. That's really what I wanted to do. Um, I ended up coaching some uh, some fourth grade flag football at one point. Um, you know, undefeated, but you know, no big deal. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, but then, uh, as the boys started to approach high school, uh, I actually was talking with my wife and, and, uh, it just became apparent, not just, be, not just because I was, you know, dad and, you know, wanted to do it, but you know, I had a wealth of knowledge about football then. Uh, and also, uh, you know, I grew up with a dad that was a football coach and, and watched what he did and, and uh, you know, really saw it as an opportunity to jump in and coach some high school boys and, and uh, uh, did that for six years, uh, which was just fantastic, man. It was the most rewarding thing I've ever done was coaching the high school boys uh, and got to coach my sons, too. But, uh, but working with those high school boys was really fantastic. Yeah, very cool. Drew, if you could just take a minute here to kind of hit my listeners with a little bit about your background and what you do. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. I, uh, I grew up in a little town of Walla Walla, Washington. Uh, went to school at Washington State University, played football up there for three years uh, until I elected to leave early and go into the NFL draft. Was drafted number one overall back in 1993 by the Patriots. Uh, nine years with the Patriots until I had a little uh, little uh, near-death experience and uh, my backup quarterback came in. Uh, he's this kid named Tom Brady. I don't think many people have heard of him, but uh, he went on to some measure of success as, as my backup quarterback. Uh, uh, but no, then uh, when uh, when Tommy uh, you know came in and, and started playing so well, then I went to Buffalo for three years, got to play for the Bills for three years, which was an amazing experience. And then my last two years were with the Dallas Cowboys, uh, retired after the 2006 season. Uh, and in 2007, launched a new business, launched a double back winery back in my hometown of Walla Walla, Washington. And uh, that's gone on to be a successful business for us and, and also a lot of fun. Uh, married my college sweetheart. She still uh, still likes me most of the time. Uh, and uh, as I said before, we got four kids. Yeah, what an incredible journey you've had here, Drew. So how old were you then uh, uh, the first time you had a child? How old were you when you first became a dad? And how did yeah, becoming a dad kind of... I dad, when I first became a dad, um, shoot, I was... Uh, well, Stu was born in ninety, so I was twenty-five. I was twenty-five. We had been uh, we'd been married for just a little bit over a year. Um, actually, told our um, told our parents on our first anniversary that they were going to be grandparents, which they were pretty excited about. Yeah, that's awesome. And how did becoming a dad kind of change your perspective on life? <laughs> you know, uh, I think the the number one thing that I tell people is that uh, I don't think I knew what it meant to be afraid until I became a dad. Um, you know, I've, I've never been known for driving slow, right? I've always been kind of a fast driver, uh, but we're driving home from the hospital day one or day two, I guess, with our uh, with our son, Stu, and all of a sudden I'm driving 55 miles an hour in the slow lane, you know, on the freeway. Um, you know, I think it, uh, you know, when you become a dad, uh, everything else in your life moves down the list of importance immediately. Um, all of a sudden it takes over the very top spot in your life and everything else is less important or in some cases more important, but only because you're, you're, uh, you're uh, it's because it's important uh, to that role as a dad. Yeah, very well said. And I, just like you, I have four kids from my wife and I uh, going from uh, two to three was really the most challenging transition for us as far as numbers of kids. Uh, uh, what was the most difficult uh, transition you would say for yourself? 
Yeah, you know, once you can't play man defense anymore and you got to go to a zone, um, life gets more complicated. Uh, we had our first, our first, the three boys are 18 months apart uh, and then 19 months apart, so they were uh, they were pretty close in age. So there were some uh, there were some interesting times there where it was a little chaotic, uh, trying to um, you know move three and then and then all of a sudden four kids uh, uh, around and keep everybody uh, in line and. and keep them out of trouble and keep them safe. And, you know, all of those things, it was, uh, it, it was, it was, it was a little crazy there for a while, but, uh, but now it's all good. I think, I think, uh, Jim Gaffigan has the best quote about having, uh, uh, more than two children. He's like, all right, imagine you're drowning and somebody throws you a baby. <laughs> and <it's> like, <laughs> you, you, when you're already, uh, when it's already chaotic and, and, uh, then you add another one to the mix, man, it gets kind of crazy, but, uh, but ultimately it was, it's been a, it's been a great ride, man. It's been a lot of fun and, and the kids are so far doing really well. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. And I've had mine the same way. I had three, we had our three boys and then we got our girl on the fourth try. So I'm right there with you on yes, that. Yeah. What, what, what about as far as uh, discipline drew, what type of disciplinarian are you as a father? And is it different than the discipline style you grew up with? Um, I don't know. I, I did probably have to ask my kids that, but, uh, you know, my, my dad actually has done a lot of, uh, uh, parenting, uh, coaching over the years parenting, uh, we have a parenting program that our charity supports and dad and mom have worked with. Um, I don't know. I think at this point, uh, they've reached over 6 million people with a, with a, uh, uh, a parenting message and a parenting curriculum that's been really effective. So, um, you know, a lot of that stuff informs what, what my wife and I do as parents, but, um, you know, in terms of, uh, in terms of discipline for, our, for our kids, um, I, I, I would like to, you know, I, I would, I would like to say, and I think my kids would hopefully echo this, that I don't really, uh, have to discipline them. We, you know, we've got very clear rules at our house, and very, uh, you know, very, uh, clear, um, uh, consequences if those rules are broken and, and, uh, you know, those things are all communicated with love and, and, and they're communicated clearly. And, and, um, because of that, the kids already know, you know, Hey, look, those are the rules. I don't break them life's pretty good <laughs> you know, and they're and they're they're not it's not uh um you know it's it's generally not very stringent stuff you know but it's it's more big picture things like um you know honesty do what you say mean or, or say what you mean mean what you say and do what you say you're gonna do right so i mean how simple is that right kids do that but uh they uh, at, at times they've had to learn um the consequences of um maybe being less than honest with their mother and oh boy, she's a sweetheart. But if you lie to her, you're in deep trouble. Um, <laughs> so thankfully that was a lesson for the boys that they only had to, uh, uh, they only had to learn once. But outside of that, man, we've, re we've really given them uh, um, over the years, a lot of latitude um, and um, their freedoms just grew. The more they earned, you know, the more we, the more we knew they could, they, that uh, they could be trusted, the more trust they earned with us, the more, uh, freedom they had um, and with the whole mission that by 18 um, they're their own person they make their own decisions you know we're always we're always there for them you know to listen and advise and so on but um, you know we really believe that once uh, once uh, once uh, 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 your child is, is 18 it's their life they get to decide what they're doing and we just hope that we've taught them well enough at that point that they can make good decisions. Yeah, good stuff. And, and you know, I like to ask all the NFL players that I have on the show here because it's, it's a difficult decision for a lot of parents out there, and that's whether or not to allow their kids to play tackle football or contact football, especially with all the confusing reports about the concussions, stuff like that. You've got kids, obviously, that have played. What, what do you, how do you feel about kids playing contact football? What's a good age for them to start? Uh, you know, a good age for them to start if they're going to play. I don't, I don't really – my personal belief is there's really not – um, much benefit in any way for kids to play tackle football before, before they're probably at least, you know, like 12, 13, 14. Um, you know, I just, you know, watching it, even if you're just talking just pure, pure football skill development, um, when you're that young, um, pads are heavy, the helmet's heavy, all this stuff, it's hard for you to even learn proper technique. And then you take some, bring in the, some of the safety issues then. Um, you know, so I just don't think there's any benefit to playing when they're young. Uh, but in terms of, uh, of uh, um, you know, football and particularly high school football, um, it's a bit of a soapbox issue for me, honestly, because 
um, both as a player and then as, obser- as an observer and then as a coach, I've seen the, the amazing benefits of being a part of a high school football team. Um, as a coach, uh, you know, we always believed and, and talked about, uh, you know, we're trying to teach these guys to be better men and, and give them life skills and give them guidance and direction and, and so on. And if they learn some football along the way, that's great. Uh, but the football part was definitely secondary. Uh, but the things that you can learn as a part of a, of a high school football team, um, you know, it's a classroom that doesn't exist very many other places. Uh, learn things like teamwork, self-sacrifice, uh, discipline. Uh, you learn um, the importance of doing things consistently all the time. Um, you know, you learn to deal with adversity. Uh, you learn to uh, function as a, as a part of a, of a, of a whole rather than, than being um, just the center of attention. You have to be a part of a team. You know, so all of these things that you learn playing high school football, um, you know, to me are so incredibly valuable. Um, you know, is there risk? Certainly there's risk, you know, but uh, you know, football, if you look at actually statistically, it's a lot safer than a lot of other things people are doing. You know, I always ask if, if somebody uh, uh, somebody uh, says they're not going to let their kid uh, play football because it's dangerous. And so, well, you're going to let them drive a car. And invariably like, yeah, I don't drive a car. Like, well, look at the statistics for, for driving an automobile. It is incredibly it, like a thousand times more dangerous than going on the football field. So you really want to keep your kids safe. Okay. You know, wrap them in bubble tape and keep them home. It's just, it turns out that life, you know, if it, and for my kids, if they weren't playing football, they're going to be doing something else dangerous. I mean, that's the, that's the bottom line. Um, so, you know, and I, had, you know, I, 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 I'm not limiting, you know, that those those qualities to just sports being part of something where um, you're part of something bigger than yourself, whether that's band, whether that's drama, whether it's, you know, the debate club or working, you know, but but for kids to be a part of something that's just bigger than themselves is so incredibly important uh, these days. Yeah, very well said. And yeah, it's almost as if your your life is in mortal danger the minute you wake up in the morning. If you start looking at all the ways you, you could go down, uh, and it's you know, crazy. You, it's crazy. We had, somebody sent me a list of like the crazy ways that people die in, in the uh, in the United States. There's some silly ones, man. There's, so there's some that you might might suspect. You know, like skateboards turns out are pretty dangerous. Uh, but, but the one that I, that was really surprising to me was thousands of people die every year. Uh, in bed from accidental strangulation or from falling out of bed. And like, wait a second, you know, if I'm not safe in bed, <laughs> what the <laughs> heck am I going to do, right? Um, so, I mean, it, you know, it's, uh, it turns out life's dangerous. And and, uh, um, and if you, uh, you know, if you keep your kids at home and don't let them do anything, well, I guess they'll be safe for the time being, but they're not going to be very healthy long term. So, uh, you know, I don't really know what the answer is. Uh, it's obviously, obviously tragic when anything happens. Uh, whether that's walking down the street or, or playing high school football, but um, I'm not really sure how you avoid the, the, those tragedies. And, and you mentioned it there earlier, Drew. I mean, you almost lost your life due to that injury that you had in the NFL. It was some serious stuff. Did, did your family uh, try to convince you to hang up the you know, the helmet at that point? Did they ask you to retire? And what was your decision? Was it difficult for you to make the choice to come back on the field? Yeah, you know, I don't know. They, first of all, no, no they didn't try to me out of plan. Um, they knew that uh, it was important to me and I wanted to continue to go. Um, you know, honestly, the one time that I thought about that, that I actually had real thoughts about not playing anymore was when I finally got healthy and uh, discovered that I wasn't going to get, you know, my job back uh, was the one time that I actually thought about uh, uh, thought about hanging them up. But that was never really very serious. Um, you know, hey, look, you know, it's a it's a you know, football, especially back then. And they've, they've, they've fixed a lot of it to a great extent. But um, you know, it was a violent game played by violent people. You understand that's the risk. And, um, you know, what I had was a really freak uh, accident. Um, I don't know that there's ever been uh, something quite like what I had um, on the football field, at least that I know of. Um, it's something that normally happens in car crashes and so on. Um, but, uh, you know, it was bleeding out internally um, at about a liter an hour in, inside my body. And, and uh, uh, But the good news for me, when they once that one healed up, um, it actually resolved itself into a better situation than it was, uh, you know, just naturally. Um, there, there, there's some scar tissue that fixed it. So, uh, but uh, yeah, you know, look, um, I knew I wanted to keep playing. My family knew I wanted to keep playing. So it was never really a discussion. 
Yeah, what, what was the uh, transition into the, the wine industry here, Drew? Was that something you had always uh, were interested in? Was it a family thing? What was the genesis of you getting involved with the wine and the double back? You know, there's a few things. First of all, we were passionate about wine. My wife and I really like wine and still do to this day. Collect wine, you know, we, um, but it was, uh, it was something the more I learned about, the more intriguing it became. Uh, but what really was kind of the turning point was that, you know, there were a lot of guys uh, in uh, New England with me that, uh, um, you know, were into wine as well. And they'd come over to the house and I'd tell them to bring over a bottle of wine when they came. So they'd come over, bring a bottle of wine. Um, we would do some blind tastings where you put the wine in paper bags and, and taste through them. Well, I would always throw something from my hometown, from Walla Walla, into the mix. Uh, and we would win, right? So it was like, damn. You know, my hometown is actually turning out really, truly world-class wine. We're, you know, they're winning these tastings with California, Bordeaux, and so on. Uh, and so, you know, that passion for wine combined with uh, uh, the opportunity to go back to my hometown and start a business uh, really made it a, a, a natural transition. Yeah, very cool. And and uh, I've I seen on your Instagram page there you have the family skiing. Is that an activity you've always been involved in, or did that come later on after your career and stuff like that? Where would that all come from? No, nah, man, my parents, we started, they started me on skis when I was two years old, man. I've been a ski bum my entire life, or at least an aspiring ski bum my entire life. Uh, and we've had the kids all skiing since they were really little. You know, you want to talk about a challenging dad day, try to get four little kids up on the ski hill where everybody's going to have two gloves, two boots, two skis, two poles, helmet, goggles, you know, just you name it. By the time we got them all up on the ski, ski hill when they were young and everybody was standing on the ski on their skis on the snow and everybody had all their gear i'm like man i feel like i accomplished like a major military operation uh <laughs> that day but it was all worth it though now man we have a ton of fun skiing together as a family yeah i see it i know i can imagine it's no easy task i've never done it it's something that's on my uh, wish list here to do with the family definitely something i'd love to experience uh, yeah, hopefully it's, it's as fun as it looks <laughs> and with it's uh so it's some long days when you start, so you got to be patient with it. It's like to anything else you take up that's new. Um, it's, uh, it's one of those that uh, if you learn when you're young, it's so much easier like so many other things. Yeah, and, and you know, uh, you, we mentioned there, obviously, your backup there, Tom Brady. He's been in the news now because he just made this move to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. I had the honor of meeting Tom down uh, at Super Bowl Media Day in his last Super Bowl. I got to talk to him about fatherhood. He's a, a, a first-class father. Uh, did, did, did you uh, see anything like this? Did you think you'd be moving to another team? Are you guys still close to this day? Yeah, yeah. No, I keep in touch uh, with Tommy quite a bit. You know, I I, uh, I, I haven't talked to him directly about it um, yet. You know, I figured he's got enough people in his ear, didn't need to be doing to, uh, to, to, to be bugging him with it. But, uh, but I will tell you that uh, um, when I made the move, and this is just my, my frame of reference, when I left New England and ended up in Buffalo, um, it was really energizing. You know, if you've been in one place for a long time, you know, even though it's you know professional football, which is amazing, um, you know, once you've done it for a long time in one place, um, it can get a little bit monotonous. And, and uh, for Tom, I'm, I'm guessing this is going to be super energizing to go to a new place, uh, try to recreate um, his success that he had in New England in a new spot. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it's just going to be really energizing for him. So, I, I, I was surprised when I found out it was Tampa, but uh, but I think it's going to be really cool for him. And Bruce Arians is a great coach, um, so he's got uh, a great situation down there. I do think it's kind of funny. His offensive coordinator is Byron Leftwich, who was drafted after Tom had already won a Super Bowl, had a nice career, retired, and is now an offensive coordinator. And Tom is still playing. Um, you know, all this time. So it'll be really, I'd, I'd love to be in the meeting room the first time they have a meeting where it's like, you got the offensive coordinator and he's going to ask the quarterback for an autograph. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, hey, hey, Tommy, will you, will you sign this for me, man? You, you've been my hero for a long time. Okay, now let's get on the chalkboard and draw some plays. You know, it's just, it'll be a really interesting deal. Yeah, and you know what, uh, uh, Drew, as we're recording this, I'm, uh, when I put it out, hopefully we're in a bit, a little bit better situation here with what's going on. But right now we're kind of uh, in the middle of this whole coronavirus thing that's going on. How has that affected your kids as far as going to school and their daily lives? And, and how are you guys handling the whole situation? Yeah, you know, we're, we're uh, well, first of all, if you want to pick the silver linings from this thing, um, uh, one is that uh, we, you know, all the college kids are going to be under one roof again for a little while. You know, everybody's everybody's home, which 
um, you know, as a dad, you know, when these kids take off to, uh, to college, it's the very definition of bittersweet, right? You're so happy for them. And, and uh, that's ultimately was the mission to get them into college so then they can go off and, and get jobs. But it, but it's also just a really bitter thing because, man, you raise these good kids and your reward is they leave. Uh, and we never thought we'd have all four of them under one, one roof for more than a couple of days at a time. And now we're going to have all four of them under one roof for, for a little while. So that's that one's positive. Um, you know, in terms of the rest of it, it certainly is something that we talk about a bunch. Uh, you know, our, our kids, uh, you know, they're staying safe. They're doing what they're supposed to do. Uh, but ultimately, you know, for us, uh, you know, my hope as you and I sit here talking today is that the worst of it's behind us and that this thing is going to be wrapped up and be okay here soon. Um, and, uh, you know, certainly hope that, that the dire predictions that are out there are uh, just sensationalized. And, and I firmly believe that they are, but, and I hope I'm right. Uh, but, uh, you know, on the, on the positive side, it's a lot of good family time and, and uh, get to hang out with the fam, drink some good wine too, which is fun. <laughs> Yeah, right on with that. And what about for yourself here, Drew? What kind of, uh, you're having some success now in the wine company. Do you, you have any type of uh, goals or plans for yourself here for the future? Yeah, you know, the, our, our business is, is uh, it's stable and growing. Um, and, you know, the big thing with that is it, it's it's pretty interesting, honestly. It's There's so many carryovers from um, being an NFL quarterback or being a quarterback in general and running a business in terms of, leadership, building a team, game planning, execution, you know, all of those things. Uh, and for me, it's its really um, a fun challenge to continue, continue building and growing our business responsibly and trying to uh, to build something that's, that's uh, not only successful, but sustainable. Um, so that one's pretty fun. And then on a more personal side, you know, I'm um, 48 and be 15 a couple of years, um, really kind of making it a mission to be healthy. Um, you know, it was really easy for a long time while you're playing ball, you're getting paid to work out and, and eat right and do all of that stuff. Um, when I retired, there was a little period of time where I was like, yeah, screw it, man. I've been doing this my whole life. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm just going to chill. Um, and that's not a good recipe for being healthy. So, uh, so yeah, trying to, trying to stay healthy, flexible and, uh, try to be active and ski as long as I can and play golf as long as I can and, um, all of that stuff. So, so that part's personal. And then, um, you know, and then with the kids, you know, you know, being the dad, um, you know, it changes as they get older. You know, they're in college now, and our, our oldest son, he's looking at, you know, um, graduating college and looking for a job. And um, it's kind of cool now to be able to um, be a friend and, you know, like more of a peer mentor uh, than it is just a, a dad uh, in these situations. Uh, so far, at least Stu, who's 22, he actually listens a little bit, which is kind of cool, you know. <laughs> I think most of us, when we were that age, thought our parents were full of crap and didn't want to hear. But uh, but Stu actually will, uh, uh, as he's going through this thing, he listens quite a bit. And, and uh, um, um, so it's you know it's kind of a cool honor to be able to talk to him about business stuff and uh, and you know job searches and how you're going to do that stuff. So that part's pretty fun. Yeah, awesome, Drew. And the last thing I want to hit you with here I, I love to ask all the dads that i get on the podcast what type of advice do you have for the new dad or for that about to be father who's out there listening you know um of all the things that you can say you know i think that that uh probably the the biggest one man is that you just got to continuously tell them that you love them and show them that you love them every day um you can't just you can't just say it but you do have to say it um, you know, you got to tell them, hey, hey, I love you. And then you got to show them that you got to show up, you got to be around, you got to be present. Uh, and if you start there, then you got a chance that they're going to listen to other things that, that, that you say, because they know that it's coming from a good place, not from a, an authoritarian, you know, place. If they know that you, uh, that you love them. Uh, and then beyond that, man, you, you know, you just, you just, you gotta, you gotta talk, you know, you gotta, you gotta communicate with them. You can't just assume that because they live under the same roof that they're, and know what your morals values are um, you actually have to talk to them about it um, those things don't get communicated by osmosis you know you, you got to uh, um, you got to talk about those things and uh, and then the last the last thing I would tell uh, parents is they're as they're moving into this thing you know one of the biggest fallacies I think uh, in parenting is this concept of quality time quality time that's that's BS man it's just time and you've got to show up. You can't just say, well, we're going to make a really cool trip to Disneyland and that's going to make up for the fact that I haven't seen you for three months. 
um, no, you gotta you gotta be there, and 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 um, you know, letting your kids know that that you are uh, there, that they are your top priority by moving other things around. So you show up at their events, and you you, know, you make it to dinner. You know, you, they uh, do all of those things. Uh, if you uh, if you just give them that time, uh, um, they will know that that they're valued. Yeah, very well said. I love the message. This has been an honor for me. I got to say, Drew Bledsoe, you're a first class father all the way. And thank you so much for giving me a few minutes of your time on First Class Fatherhood. Right on, man. And again, I just got to tell you, thank you for doing this, man. That's a really cool thing uh, to put out there, you know, for um, new dads and all that to know that uh, that um, some of these, uh, you know, uh, famous athletes um, are actual real dads. It's a really cool thing you're doing, man. So thanks for doing it.